Hello and welcome to the review of chapter one of Costanzo's physiology textbook. The purpose of this series is to review the main points of each chapter to help you studying. So feel free to listen in or follow along with the textbook, or if you have the textbook yourself, review the chapter with me. I'm gonna break up each chapter into separate parts to keep it concise. And today we're gonna to go all the way up to the resting membrane potential. We'll cover resting membrane potentials all the way to synaptic transmission in a second part. And then the third part of this chapter, we'll go over the muscles. This book is also quite helpful because it has some clinical scenarios throughout it. Those examples are given in the boxes. I won't directly cover those examples just for time's sake, but they are quite good to read over just to help solidify these concepts in your mind. And with all that being said, if you enjoy the video, please don't forget to give it a like as it does help this small channel grow. So to start with, we go over the volume and composition of body fluids. So it may surprise you to know that the total body water is actually 50 to 70% of our body weight. So up to half of your body weight is pure water. Now the more fat that you have, the less of your body weight is constituted with water, just because obviously fat is taking up the majority of your body weight at that point. And because of that, and just because of our body makeup, females tend to have a higher percentage of adipose tissue, so then they have less body water relative to their body weight. So all this water is within several body compartments. Now we have two main body compartments. We've got our intracellular fluid, and as it suggests, that's within cells. And then we have our extracellular fluid, meaning that it's outside of cells. We can divide this up into one third, two thirds. So two thirds of our total body water is within our intracellular fluid, as you would expect, since our bodies are made out of cells. And then the other third is within the extracellular fluid, so outside of the cells. Now the extracellular fluid can be divided again into two other compartments. So our interstitial fluid, which is the fluid just that surrounds our cells, and then our plasma, which is obviously within our blood vessels themselves. So this can be divided roughly into two thirds, one thirds again. It's more three quarters, one quarter, but to make matters simple, thinking of everything as thirds makes this easier. So if we look at it all together in this figure, total body water can divide it into thirds in terms of intracellular versus extracellular fluid, and then our extracellular fluid can be divided into two thirds interstitial fluid versus one third plasma. And these are separated by semi-permeable membranes. So the cell membrane obviously divides the intra versus extracellular fluid, and then the capillary wall or the blood vessel wall separates our plasma and our interstitial fluid. The main difference here is that the capillary wall is impermeable to our proteins. So proteins can't go from our plasma into the interstitial fluid, which changes the constitutions of these two compartments. And then the cell membrane has certain proteins that we'll get to later on in this chapter, which actually alters the substances within the intracellular fluid versus the extracellular. For instance, there is low sodium within the cell, but high potassium. So these membranes help to divide these compartments and divide how they're constituted. Now next we get into some definitions, so I'm just going to list these off for you. So amounts of a solute, so the pure quantity, can be expressed as either moles, a mole is just 6 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules of a substance, or they can be described as an equivalent. An equivalent actually takes into account the charge of the solute. So for instance, one mole of a calcium ion is actually two milli equivalents because calcium has a two plus charge. And then also osmoles is another way to describe the quantities of a solute. Osmoles just describes the number of particles which can actually dissociate into a solution. So kind of how much dissolves. And that kind of plays into osmolarity. Osmolarity just defines the concentration of particles in solution. So that's just osmoles per liter, or the concentration in the sense of a solution. Now pH, we've probably heard of pH before, you know that defines whether we're acidic or alkaline. pH is just a logarithmic term to express how much hydrogen ions are present. And the reason behind that is because hydrogen ions are in such small quantities that if you try to express how much hydrogen ion is present, then you're talking about these crazy low numbers. So 10 to the power of negative nine. So in order to turn it into something that we can actually visualize and appreciate, we use a logarithmic scale to turn it into a number between one and 14. Now it is a negative logarithmic of the concentration of hydrogen, meaning that the higher the hydrogen concentration, 
the lower the pH. That's why it's negative here. So negative logarithmic of the concentration of hydrogen ions, which describes whether it's acidic, if it's lower than seven, or alkaline, if it's higher than seven. Now, another concept that's important to know is the electroneutrality of our body fluid compartments. And that's just meaning that two different compartments also have to equalize in the charge that they have between them. So meaning they need to have the same amount of positive charges or cations and negative charges and or anions. So concentration and electrical charge has to be considered to determine the movement of ions or particles. We'll get to that very shortly in this chapter as well. So it briefly describes our composition of our intra and extracellular fluid. Remember extracellular fluid mainly have sodium which gets balanced out because of this electroneutrality rule by having chloride, which is negative, and bicarbonate, which is also negative. In the intracellular fluid, we mainly have potassium and magnesium as our cations, and then our balancing anions are proteins, which have a negative charge, and organic phosphates as well. Some other little differences is that the intracellular fluid has low calcium because of some protein channels that pump calcium out of the cell, which we'll get to, and also the intracellular fluid is more acidic. Now, although there's different concentrations of all these different types of ions, the actual osmolarity of the two body fluid compartments, so the intracellular and extracellular fluid, are actually the same. So the osmolarity are the same because water can flow freely between the two. So if one area, so if the intracellular fluid or the extracellular fluid changes its osmolarity, then water will then flow in between the two because it is able to flow between the cell membrane freely to then equalize the osmolarity. So now we get to how we actually have these concentration differences across the cell membrane. It's mainly due to these pumps that I talked about before. So we have three main pumps that are actively pushing those ions across the cell membrane against the concentration gradient. So although there's low sodium within the cell, we have the sodium potassium ATPase pump that's actively pushing more sodium out of the cell. And it's able to do that because it uses energy from a molecule called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. ATP works by giving energy by breaking off one of those phosphate bonds, releasing energy that's then utilized by the pump to be able to move ions against its concentration gradient. So it pumps sodium out and it pumps potassium into the cell, both against their concentration gradients. We have two other ones to notice as well. We've got the calcium ATPase that pumps calcium out of the cell against its electrochemical gradients. And then we also have a hydrogen ion pump as well. So these are examples of primary active transport which use ATP directly to move ions against the concentration gradient across the cell membrane. We then have other transporters that use this concentration gradient to help shuttle other molecules across. We'll talk about that very briefly here, but the main point is that the cell membranes have selective permeabilities to maintain these concentration gradients. So molecules will only be able to move across the cell membrane if the cell membrane essentially allows it. So there's a selective permeability to maintain the concentration concentration that we want within the cell or outside of the cell as well. Now there is a difference between the plasma and our interstitial fluid. Remember because the capillary membrane is impermeable to proteins, so proteins stay within the plasma. This results in a Gibbs donor equilibrium, which just basically means that since there's more plasma proteins within the plasma, proteins have a negative charge which then actually draws a little bit more cations in the plasma and encourages more anions to leave the plasma. So there's slightly higher sodium and potassium in the plasma and slightly lower chloride within the plasma. Now that's generally pretty minor differences that we don't really notice, uh, but that is the Gibbs donor equilibrium, the influence of the negatively charged proteins that can't cross the capillary membrane. So if we get to the characteristics of our cell membranes, we will see how it's selectively permeable. So it has both lipids and proteins within it. The lipids it controls how much passive diffusion occurs, so just simple movement of molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration, down its concentration gradient, 
because the lipids will only allow lipid soluble molecules to diffuse through the cell membrane because the majority of the cell membrane is just a lipid. Non-lipid soluble molecules will have to wait. They cannot just passively diffuse through. They will need an actual carrier protein or something to help shuttle it across that cell membrane. So right away we have selectively prevented non-lipid soluble substances from easily diffusing across the cell membrane. Whereas lipid soluble substances like carbon dioxide, oxygen, fatty acid, steroid hormones can all just diffuse straight across. Now the protein components of the cell membranes allows control of those non-lipid soluble substances through transport proteins, but there's also some that have enzymatic function and also functioning as hormone receptors on the outer surface of the cell membrane. So if we dive a little bit further into each of these components, the lipids, we have a phospholipid bilayer that makes up the cell membrane. You can kind of see this in this model here, where this is the entire thickness of the cell membrane. We have phospholipids on the top and phospholipids on the bottom. The reason why they're orientated like this is because they are made up of a cholesterol head, which is hydrophilic, meaning that it likes water. And then they also have these tails made out of fatty acids. These tails are hydrophobic. So the fatty acids are hydrophobic, meaning they do not like water or are water insoluble. So the hydrophobic areas collect together, so they point inwards, whereas the hydrophilic surfaces are on the outer surface and they kind of just diffuse into the aqueous solution of the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid on the outside. So that creates this lipid bilayer, allows lipids to diffuse across prevents non-lipid substances from diffusing across. So then we have our proteins. We've got peripheral proteins, integral proteins, and channel proteins or carrier proteins. And this is all depicted on the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes as seen here. So it talks about the integral proteins first. Now these are kind of embedded in here because there's hydrophobic interactions with these fatty acids in the middle here. So they are kind of set in place. Now they may have multiple roles such as being a transport protein, being a pore on the ion channel, but they may also be a part of the GTP binding protein system or the G protein system, which interacts with secondary messenger systems within the actual cell itself. Or they may be a receptor for ligands to bind to. So these proteins have multiple functions. They may be transporters, they may be receptors, they may be involved with intracellular signaling, but essentially they are integral proteins, meaning they are embedded within the cell membrane. The majority of them actually span across it. The peripheral proteins kind of just sit on the side here and they are held in there by almost just charges or hydrogen bonds so they are more easily lost from the cell membrane and they may have multiple different functions but for instance the one they give is anchoring which is almost just as it suggests an anchor to kind of hold the cell or the cell membrane in place and then lastly we've got our gated ion channels these we will talk about shortly here which open and close to allow the movement of ions so we should talk about the transport across cell membranes next. So we've talked briefly about primary active transport, which means it directly uses ATP to move a molecule against its concentration gradient. But we can also have secondary active transport, which means that a molecule gets transported against its concentration gradient, coupled with another molecule that's going down its concentration gradient. Now we will talk about that also very briefly here, but just as a little introduction. It first starts to talk about carrier mediated transport meaning that any system that uses a protein to transport a molecule has to abide by the rules of carrier-mediated transport. And it has these three features and it compares them against simple diffusion, meaning just the movement of a molecule across a cell membrane without the need for a carrier protein. One of these features of carrier-mediated transport is that they can be saturated, meaning that there's only a certain amount of molecules that can move at a certain period of time. So when there is a low concentration of those molecules, then the transport rate increases exponentially with an increase in concentration because there is no limit on saturation. But once the concentration of that molecule actually increases to a certain point, we start to saturate that molecule and now there's too many molecules trying to get squeezed through one protein carrier that now we start to have a limited diffusion through that carrier protein. And so eventually it levels out and we can only do a certain amount of transport through that carrier protein at a certain concentration. And any increase in concentration 
does not result in any further increase in transportation across the cell membrane. This is called the transport maximum. So there is this transport maximum to carrier mediated proteins. Now that is different to simple diffusion because the only thing that changes with simple diffusion is that an increase in concentration means that there's going to be an increase in diffusion. So there is no limit to the transport rate with tr simple diffusion. But with carrier mediated transport, the actual dif transport of the molecules across the cell membrane at low concentrations is by far more rapid than simple diffusion. So that carrier protein actually helps almost push those molecules across the cell membrane at those low concentrations. And then eventually it gets saturated and it's just letting through as many as possible determined by its transport maximum. Now another feature is that they are stereospecific and that just means that they will only allow a certain type of molecule through. Now, if you don't know what an isomer is, then this may be a little bit confusing, but every single molecule has two forms, which is just a mirror image of itself. So glucose, for instance, has D-glucose, but it also has L-glucose. So if you put the molecule up on a piece of paper, and then you put a mirror next to it, and so then you had the other molecule on this side, but there's the mirror version, it's actually not the same molecule. So every single molecule has this mirror version or almost like an evil twin. And the carrier protein is actually stereospecific for that type of molecule. And what you'll find is that one of these isomers are actually the only biologically active form. And then the last feature of carrier mediated transport is that there is some competition. So although they are specific to a certain molecules, they may also allow other types of similar molecules through. So the glucose example, it may also allow D-galactose to go through that carrier protein. So then if there's more D-galactose, that almost outcompetes the glucose, so you end up with more transport of galactose instead of glucose reducing the availability of glucose. So those are our carrier-mediated transport. Now this doesn't matter if it's facilitated diffusion, primary active transport, secondary active transport, all of these guys that use a protein to move their ions or their molecules have these three features to them. Versus simple diffusion, which is just the movement of molecules across a semi-permeable membrane, as a result of random thermal motion. It's similar to if you have 10 people squished up into a closet and then you create a semi-permeable membrane by opening the door, which enters into a larger room, what you'll find is that there will be some simple diffusion of those 10 people as people spread out into the larger room. It's just natural for all those molecules that are randomly haphazardly bouncing around to spread out into larger areas. So that is simple diffusion and there are some components to it which determines the net diffusion rate. The net diffusion of a solute is actually called the flux or flow represented by J. And it is dependent on these five variables outlined here that we'll briefly just go over. Obviously, one of the main ones here is the concentration gradient. You have a greater concentration gradient, then you're gonna have a greater movement of molecules from the high to the low. Partition coefficient just represents the solubility of the solute in oil relative to water. So if there's a greater solubility in oil, or it has a greater lipid solubility, then it's going to be able to more easily transport across that cell membrane, so its diffusion is going to be greater. So the greater partition coefficient, the greater its diffusion capability. Then we have diffusion coefficient. Diffusion coefficient just correlates to both the molecule size and also the viscosity of the medium. So if you have a smaller molecule and a very low viscosity solution, then you're going to have a faster diffusion because you've got a smaller molecule that can move faster through a non-viscous solution. Another component of diffusion is the thickness of the membrane, which is self-explanatory. The thicker the membrane, the larger the distance to move, then the slower the diffusion. And then lastly here is the surface area. Once again, it's similar to the thickness in terms of logic here. If you have a greater surface area, then you're gonna have a greater diffusion across a semi-permeable membrane. Now we can actually group some of these characteristics into just one term called permeability. Permeability just represents the partition coefficient times the diffusion coefficient divided by the thickness of the membrane. So you can calculate the permeability of a substance and then turn that into a more simplified equation 
for net diffusion, which is just the permeability times the surface area times the concentration gradient will give you the net diffusion of a molecule. Now, when you have an electrolyte, you have another factor that you have to consider when it comes to the diffusion of it across a membrane, and that is that it is charged. So since you have a charge to it, so for instance, sodium having a positive charge, you now have to consider the electrical difference across the cell membrane. So if it is positive on the outside of the cell and negative within the cell, you're obviously going to promote the movement of a positive molecule from the outside to in. So that's one factor you have to consider with an electrolyte. The second factor is that the actual movement of that ion across the cell membrane also creates a charge itself. So moving a positive ion from the outside to the inside of a cell will create a positive charge within the cell itself. And that is called the diffusion potential. So keep that in mind because that's going to come in handy when we talk about the NERTS potential later on in this video. So now to get into the different types of carrier-mediated transport systems. So one is facilitated diffusion, which just means that there is a non-lipid soluble molecule that needs to go from outside the cell to inside the cell or via vice versa, but it can't cross the cell membrane. And it's still going down its concentration gradient, it just needs a membrane protein to allow it to move. So an example of that is the GLUT4 transporter that just allows glucose to move down its concentration gradient across the cell membrane. So facilitated diffusion is just as it sounds, it is simple diffusion, just facilitated by a carrier protein. That's different to primary active transport and secondary active transport because it's moving a molecule against its concentration gradient. We've talked about this multiple times now. Primary active transport uses ATP directly to move a molecule against its concentration gradient. We have the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which it gets into a little bit more detail here, and there's a little figure about how this works, how we actually have these two different states, the E1 state and the E2 state. E1 state just means that once it gets phosphorylated within the cell using the ATP and accepting the sodium ions, it's then able to do a conformational change to turn into E2. E2 then releases its sodium into the extracellular fluid and then accepts potassium while losing its phosphorus. So then E2 then can do a conformational change into E1 and then release its potassium within the cell. This can get inhibited by cardiac glycosides, so digitalis for instance, which is a treatment for various cardiovascular diseases. We can actually block the potassium from going into E2 and then causing that conformational change. The other types of primary active transports are the calcium ATPase pumps, which do exist on the cell membranes, but also exist on the sarcoplasmic reticulum and muscles and endoplasmic reticulum of other cells. So this helps to actually actively pump sodium once again out of the intracellular fluid, but this time into the endoplasmic or sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then lastly here we have the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, which is located in the stomach to pump hydrogen out into the stomach to create an acidic environment, which can be inhibited by the drug imiprazole, and is also located in the kidneys as well to pump hydrogen out. And then lastly here we have our secondary active transport. Once again, this is against a concentration gradient, but this time the ATP has been used somewhere else. That's why it's secondary. So for instance, if we want to move glucose from outside the cell to inside the cell, one way to do that is to actually couple it with sodium, allow sodium to go down its concentration gradient into the cell. So going from a high concentration outside the cell to a low concentration within the cell. So sodium is able to move down its concentration gradient, but we're just going to couple it with glucose. So then glucose is then able to go against its concentration gradient, so going from a low to a high concentration. So these carrier-mediated proteins need both of these molecules in order to allow the movement of both. So you can't just have sodium moving by itself through this carrier-mediated protein. It needs both there. And the reason why it's a secondary active transport is because ATP was actually used before by the sodium potassium ATPase to get all the sodium outside of the cell to create that concentration gradient to then allow sodium to move down it and take glucose with it. 
So ATP was used somewhere, so it is still an active system, it just wasn't used directly for the movement of glucose. So the molecule that's moving against its concentration gradient, if it is moving in the same direction as the molecule that it's coupled to that's going down its concentration gradient, then it's called a co-transporter or symporter. So for instance, the caryomediated protein in this example is a co-transporter because it's allowing sodium and glucose to move in the same direction. Whereas if it's in the opposite direction, where let's say glucose was actually going to leave the cell here against the concentration gradient while sodium moved down its concentration gradient into the cell, then that is called a counter transporter or an antiport or an exchanger. So if the two molecules are moving in an opposite direction via secondary active transport, then it is named one of these, so the counter transport antiport or exchanger. Examples of co-transporters are, for instance, glucose, as we talked about, or amino acids as well. Very common in the intestinal epithelial cell as we'll get to in the later GI chapters. And then examples of the counter-transporters, there's one which is a calcium-sodium exchanger, which functions to once again push calcium against its concentration gradient, push it out of the cell, along with the calcium primary active transport to really lower the calcium within the cell. And then there's also a sodium-hydrogen exchanger as well. I know it might be a bit confusing hearing all these different types of transporters, don't try to memorize all these specific examples because you will become familiar with them as we go through the different organ systems. Right now, just understand the process of secondary active transport, primary active transport, facilitated diffusion, simple diffusion, you know, understand those key concepts for now and you'll get to know the examples later on in this textbook. And lastly, there's also the concept of osmosis, which is purely just the flow of water across a semi-permeable membrane due to differences in solute concentration. So if we have a high solute concentration on one end of a chamber, then that will promote the movement of water into it to try and reduce it. Now, osmosis occurs due to the pressure difference. Now, it makes this differentiation here saying that osmosis is the movement of water due to a pressure difference, whereas diffusion is a concentration difference. Now, osmolarity helps to determine the movement of water. So obviously osmolarity is the concentration of a solution. So if you have a highly osmolar solution compared to a low osmolar solution, so the example is A over here, so you have a high osmolar solution on the left, you're gonna get movement of water from the right to the left because you're trying to reduce the osmolarity and create an isosmotic solution or environment. So you're trying to equalize the two osmolarities through the movement of water. Osmolality is different to osmolarity only in how it is expressed. So osmolarity is the osmoles per liter, whereas osmolality is the concentration of osmoles per kilogram of water. It's effectively the same, it's just how the units are expressed. So a couple of definitions here. Osmotic pressure just really describes the driving force or the driving pressure for that water moving from from one solute to another. If there is two compartments separated by a semi-permeable membrane that have the same osmotic pressure, then they are said to be isotonic relative to one another. And then down here we have the reflection coefficient, which just describes the movement of a solute across a membrane. So a reflection coefficient may be between zero and one. If it is zero, then it is freely permeable to the solute, so that solute can move right across that membrane. Whereas if it's a reflection coefficient of one, then it is impermeable to that solute. So moving on, we then come to ion channels. Now ion channels are selective to certain ions. So they will only allow the movement of a particular type of ion when it is open, which is determined by its gates. Now there's a term here called conductance. Conductance just means the probability that that channel is open and thus is allowing the movement of ions. So if you have a high conductance, there's a great probability that that channel is going to be ion and there's going to be free movement of the particular ion through it. Whereas if you have low conductance, then it's a high probability it's going to be closed and no movement is going to occur. Now there are three types of sensors that actually tell these gates on ion channels to open. We have voltage gated sensors, meaning that once the actual membrane potential across the cell membrane gets to a certain level, then it will open or close the gates. And we'll get to that very shortly in the next video. 
going over action potentials. We have secondary messenger gated channels, meaning that there's these secondary messengers also that we'll get to later on in this textbook, such as CAMP or cyclic adenosine monophosphate or IP3, which gets created. For instance, those G proteins we talked about earlier, they create CAMP. So if these secondary messengers within the cell accumulate, they may open a certain channel to allow them passage of ions. So there's this intracellular signaling to then tell a certain ion channel to open. And then thirdly, lastly here, we have the ligand gated channels. And these are opened due to either hormones or neurotransmitters. So some kind of chemical outside the cell binds to this ligand gated channel to either open it or close it. So we have these three types of sensors that will either open or close our ion channels. Now we have talked about diffusion potentials briefly. Remember that is the, the charge that is generated by the movement of an electrolyte or a charged solute down its concentration gradient. So moving a positive ion into a cell then creating a positive charge within the cell. Now the magnitude of this potential is dependent on the concentration gradient of that ion. Now it is important to note that the movement of these ions that creates these charges within the cell do not really influence the ultimate concentration of the ions in the bulk solution. So meaning that when we have high sodium on the outside of a cell that then moves into a cell and creates a positive charge within the cell, that positive charge will increase dramatically relative to a pretty small and insignificant reduction in concentration of sodium outside the cell. And that's important because we create this equilibrium potential. Because as you could imagine, if you have a high concentration of sodium outside of a cell, that then moves across the semi-permeable membrane into the cell and we start to increase the charge within the cell itself, suddenly that positive charge within the cell will then stop the movement of sodium across the membrane even though the concentration gradient is still present. So this electrical potential or this diffusion potential that gets created from the movement of an ion will actually stop its own movement even though the concentration gradient is still present. And then we'll cancel itself out. And that brings us to the Nernst equation. The Nernst equation really just tells us what concentration gradient and what membrane potential will cancel each other out. So at which point will the movement of ions down this concentration gradient stop because of the membrane potential created or the diffusion potential created? For example, we have all the Nernst equations or Nernst potentials of these various ions down here. So for sodium, it's positive 65 millivolts. So as soon as the intracellular space becomes positive 65 millivolts, it will stop the movement of sodium down its own concentration gradient. So you can calculate the Nernst potential for each separate ion. For example, calcium, it will have to get to positive 120 millivolts before it stops the movement of its own self down its concentration gradient. Potassium, it's negative 95 because remember potassium has a higher concentration within the cell. So it moves out of the cell, which takes its positive charge out of the cell. So then it becomes negative within the cell because we always talk about membrane potential expressed as the intracellular potential. So as soon as within the cell it becomes negative 95, it's going to stop the movement of potassium out of the cell because it's holding all those positive charges within it. So negative 95 will stop the movement of potassium out of the cell. For chloride, it's negative 90. Now in the cell membrane, we will have the movement of all of these ions at the same time. So a cell membrane won't instantly equalize to every single one because that's impossible. So the membrane potential that is present at the cell membrane is going to be different than each individual cell. For instance, in the nerve cell, it's actually around negative 70 as a resting membrane potential that we'll get to in the next video. So that gets us to another type of equation which is called the net driving force. Now the net driving force is just what the actual membrane potential is. So let's say at a nerve cell it's negative 70 minus what the calculated equilibrium potential is or that Nernst potential for that particular ion. So if it's negative 70 and we, we want to look at sodium, then negative 70 minus a positive 65 is going to be our net driving force, which is clearly going to drive sodium 
enter the cell if it is able to but in a nerve cell you're impermeable to sodium at the resting state and that is very important when it comes to creating an action potential so this driving force is the difference between the resting membrane potential and whatever this NERTS potential is that will then determine the movement of the ion so for example for potassium if negative 70 is the resting membrane potential but the NERTS potential for potassium is actually negative 95 that's actually going to encourage more movement of potassium out of the cell to try to get it to this negative 95 so that driving force is just telling us what that particular ion how it would like to move to get closer to its own potential and then that gets us to the last concept here which is ionic current Ionic current is describing the movement of an ion across a cell membrane. So it is dependent on the driving force of that ion. So for sodium, that driving force is wanting to move that sodium into the cell, but it's also dependent on the conductance of that ion as well. So a resting nerve axon is going to have no conductance for sodium. So there's not going to be any movement into the cell. So then the ionic current is also zero. But if that conductance increases and now there's free movement, then we're going to get movement of sodium into the cell. So then we then going to have a current within the cell so an ionic current for sodium as it moves into the cell so the direction of the ionic current is determined by the driving force and then the magnitude is determined by the conductance of the ion and then the size of the driving force so if you have a very large driving force you're obviously going to get a large current created now it is important to note that the ionic current is equivalent to ohm's law if you switch conductance out for resistance now if you know physics then this all makes sense but conductance is the reciprocal of resistance so where ohm's law equals current equals voltage divided by the resistance we switch resistance out for conductance so the reciprocal so current equals the voltage times the conductance then we end up with our ionic current equation up the top here which is equal to our conductance times our driving force which is our voltage. It's a little bit of a confusing concept here, but it's important to just note that biological systems work in physics realm. So I hope that made sense, and I hope you enjoyed this first chapter. I hope to see you in the next video. Please feel free to drop a comment, and if you'd like to get downloadable audio content of these chapters or just support the channel, please consider the Patreon link within the description. You can also find a link to the textbook. Otherwise, I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.